uh, Ephesians 1, uh, verses 8 and 9 and, 7 through 9 and 17 through 19. All right. That he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory, glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable, incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength. Uh, Philippians 2.5 reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Lord, I ask for your power and your grace to be upon me. I ask for you to kill my nerves. I ask for you to not let me be upset about the website not being up and things of that nature that may distract me right now. Calm me down right now to get into right standing with you so that I may bring a word, bring a word of, that you have for your people and myself. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As you take your seat, as you take your seat, I want to speak to you again. We're in the Jesus perspective, the Jesus perspective. I want to preach to you on the, the subject of you are an enlightened saint. You are an enlightened saint. Are you aware today that you have been given the mind of Christ? In order for us to truly reign with Christ and rule over all the things with him, we must have both the heart and mind of Christ. We must think as he thinks and feel as he feels. We must have both his wisdom and his compassion. The good news of our inheritance is that in Christ, we have not only inherited the nature of Christ, the character traits of his love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, but we have been given Christ's ability to make wise, sound decisions and judgments. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that the riches of God's grace abound toward us. In all wisdom and prudence, he said that God has made known to us the mysteries of his will and given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was that the eyes of their understanding might be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, that are, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Ask yourself, what did Christ want to know that he was incapable of knowing? Nothing. What did Christ desire to, to understand that he could not understand? Nothing. What remained a mystery to Christ about God the Father? Nothing. Just as a child grows in the ability to use more of the brain cells that he was given at birth, so do we grow in our uh, ability to understand the deeper things of God as we grow in our relationship with Christ Jesus. Our inheritance is to have the mind of Christ. The scripture says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, which means your mind will be renewed. Remember, the spirit and the flesh don't get along. The spirit is always trying to lead you in the right direction. The flesh is always trying to lead you in the wrong direction. And your mind is stuck in the middle. And he's saying, have this mind that is in Christ Jesus. See, it says that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. But the more we become in sync with Christ, the more his thoughts are our thoughts and the more his ways become our ways. See, when you become in sync and you begin to mature in Christ, you begin to do what Christ wants you to do. See, see, remember when, when, when Jesus said to Peter, he said, one day as you're a young man, you do everything you want to do. But as you become old, somebody going to lead you where you don't want to go and you're going to go anyway because you matured. See, sometimes God will lead you somewhere you don't want to go. I remember when I caught that midnight train to Virginia. Come on, somebody. It was supposed to be the midnight train to Georgia, but God said, no, I need you to take the midnight train the other way and go to Virginia. God will begin to lead you some places you don't even want to go, but when you mature in him, your ways become synced with his. You don't worry about what it is you want. You don't worry about what it is that's your will. You want to do exactly 
what God wants you to do. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14 and 16 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which a man's which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know him because they are spiritually discerned. But we have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> See, we have the mind of Christ. See, to us have been given the keys to the kingdom. See, see, you know how you be in class and you don't want to ask the teacher a question because you want to seem like you know everything, but when everybody leaves, you be like, hey, I got to ask you a question. Because you didn't want everybody else to know that you didn't know the answer. You know, you, you so smart. And, and, but that's how the disciples were. Jesus would tell a, a, a parable and when nobody knows, and the disciples would act like they knew, yeah, preach it, Jesus, preach it, Jesus. Oh, oh hey, 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 hey. Ain't nobody, hey, Jesus, hey, what you meant about that parable, <laughs> the wheat and the tares? And, and see, he began to tell them and share with them. Why? Because they had a relationship with him. And the way you build a relationship with him is to read your word, to pray, worship him in spirit and in truth, to fast, to supplicate, and begin to fellowship with him. And then you begin to be given the keys to the kingdom. See, prior to your acceptance, Christ, of Christ uh, Jesus as your Savior. Did you ever have experiences where you read the Bible and didn't understand it? But then the more you begin to come into fellowship with Christ, the more it's revealed to you because you've been in a relationship. Come on, somebody. Have you been around somebody? You don't know what they're talking about. But, but then as you get to know them, you know what they're saying. Have you been around somebody that you really never really understand what they say, but then you get to know them, but nobody else around them understand what they're saying, but you do? Come on, somebody. I'm just trying to make it plain for you. See, 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 when you begin to come in right standing and begin to have a relationship with Jesus, you hear him far more clearer than you did before you had a relationship with him. See, Paul identified three things the believer in Christ Jesus is to know with an overflowing understanding. First of all, the hope of his calling. Second, the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance in the saints. And three, the exceeding greatness of Christ's power. All right? First, the hope of his calling on our lives. See, so many people, ha as an excuse uh, for failing to become involved with ministry and outreach, he's, they say, God doesn't have a calling on my life. See, really what they're saying is, I'm not called to full-time ministry, so I'm not called to do anything. Everyone is called to be a minister. Maybe not the pulpit, maybe not to have a collar and a cross on, but we are all called to minister and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people out here who are lost. We are all called to bring people out of the darkness into the marvelous light. We are all called to be witnesses on our job. It's not just pastor's job to bring people to Christ and bring them to church. People should already come here ready to be saved before I get in the pulpit because you the light of the world, and you brought somebody here to Christ. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, 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 see the minister and pray and listen. We are supposed to do that with everybody. See, first of all, the call is in three parts. It's an upward call. Paul wrote, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching toward for to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, 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 it continually compels you to, to be better and continue, continuously makes you want to push forward. See, some of us, see, 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 you know, some of us don't want to witness to people because of what we did yesterday, last night, last Last week, last year, and Lord, I did all this wrong. But you don't understand, Jesus died to redeem me. You got to forget those things which are behind and press those things which are ahead. And some of us get stuck by looking at the stuff we used to do. Oh, child, back in 1985, we sure did it, didn't we? 
Still on the same stuff you did yesteryear. Well, what have you done for God lately? God did not call you just to have some milestone in your life that you continue to talk about and brag about. He wants you to do what it is he has before you. God says, where there's no vision, the people perish. So if you steal on this side of glory, God has something for you to fulfill. If you still living, whether you 9 or 99, I don't care how young or old you are, if you're still here, God has a purpose for you. But see, some folk satisfied with salvation. That's all they want. That's why they don't, that's why people try to act like they don't know what the vision is. The, build, the vision is to build kingdom minded people to serve the community. And see, the building begins, the vision begins to dictate what you get. But see, some folk just want a church where they can look at the stained glass windows. They don't want nobody to track you know, the dirt of real ministry in the house. They don't want kids in the church because their shoes muddy and they came in out the rain. You got to be up to the point where you don't get satisfied like Hezekiah with your own salvation. You got to begin to reach for other people and bring them up. People just want to see a stained glass window. A traditional pew. But they don't really want to get their hands dirty in ministry. When you really begin to understand that you called of God to be a minister to everybody, even if you're not a minister, you won't get satisfied that you always got your same seat every Sunday. You'll be happy when somebody comes in and a stranger is in your seat. Oh, but sometimes we just get satisfied with our own salvation. <coughs> That's all it is. Gonna choke myself up. <laughs> <coughs> see, but when you begin to grow in Christ, see, also it's a holy call. And Paul wrote to Timothy, share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. See, you were already separated and sanctified before time began. He already knew who you were. He already knew you would be called by his name. You already been chosen before the foundations of the world to be separate. See, some of you all think holy means you ain't done no wrong. And when somebody's seeing you think they ain't holy, while you being unholy, judging them right then at that moment. Yeah, see, some people think, hold on, oh, look what they're doing. Well, what you doing? You judging. So you, you done messed up there. Can we just touch that? I don't know why they called him to do that because he showed. And what are you doing, my dear? You're judging someone, aren't you? So therefore, you are not holy either. But no, holy means you are set apart for God. See, you're going to sin. You're going to fall. You ain't nothing but a bag of dirt. You're going to mess up. I'm not saying live your life how you want to live it in any old way, but what I am saying, you will fall. And Jesus already knew that, so he died for you. But you are wholly sanctified, set apart to be used by God. It is not that you're perfect. It's just you know that you are a vessel for God, and that's what makes you holy. When you minister to somebody that needs ministered to, that's what makes you holy. When you do what God tells you to do, that's what makes you holy. That's what makes you holy. When you understand that you are set apart by God. See, the problem is you think you own yourself. That's why when leadership begins to bring a vision, you think leadership doing something they want to do. You know, sometimes God tells me to do stuff here I don't even want to do. I remember mean, one time somebody sent me a message saying, I, I don't know why you do this and do this and do this. And I said, you know what, baby, I don't either. Because I don't want to do half the stuff God asking me to do either. Come on, somebody. But when you get old, come on, you got to understand what Jesus was saying to Peter. When you're young, you begin to do what you want. But when you begin to mature in me, somebody going to lead you somewhere you don't even want to go. That's what holiness is. Holiness is serving what God tells you to serve, even if you don't want to go. Let me see that. Medicine is, is giving five dollars to your enemy when your God tell you to. I know that don't seem like a lot, but we don't like somebody. Come on, somebody. And God say, give them five dollars. <laughs> I know gas prices went up and it probably ain't gonna do much, but when God tells you to bless your enemy, I'm just saying, I just leave it right there. See, we no longer think like the world. 
we think like God. See, it says that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. That's when we're in the world, but when we begin to come in Christ and mature in Christ, his ways begin to become our ways. His thoughts begin to become our thoughts. His vision becomes our vision. What he wants becomes what we want because the more we forge a relationship with Jesus, the more we want to do what he wants us to do. Third fold of the calling, I'm still on number one, but I'm on the third part. It's a, it's a heavenly calling. Our calling is always to live a godly life that will influence others to accept Christ and receive eternal life. Everything we do as believers in Christ Jesus should be done so that it might bear spiritual fruit and have eternal benefit. Hebrews 3.1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. See, we are no longer citizens of this world, but rather citizens of heaven. That's why he says, I will hide you in the secret place. Come on, somebody. See, you got to begin to understand that, you, that this mess down here, don't, don't even concern yourself. I, it was too much stuff going on with water. It was too much stuff going on with the board. It was too much stuff going on with the budget. It was too much stuff going on in the community. And when I began to focus more on the things of God, I didn't worry about the naysayers down here. Because really, if you really with God, he keeps you in the secret place. The weapon may form against you, but it won't prosper. You have got to get to the point where you understand that your enemy is the devil yeah racism may be looking at you yeah somebody may be doing you wrong but at the end of the day the author of confusion is the devil and you got to get to the point where you don't pay that mess no mind I got time to do what you know how like I was telling this morning somebody a little baby come up to you and you know you ain't hungry and mad you patient they come up to you trying to fight you because they mad he be like, come on, little baby. Go on now. Go to your mama. And come, 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 come get your baby now. And because you don't worry about it because you know you, you, you too big to be messing with a little baby. They can't really hurt you. And when you begin to mature in God, when people come at you, be like, come on now, baby. Go on now. Go on about your business. Now, I keep telling you to leave me alone. I don't want to call my daddy on you. Don't, don't make me pray on you. Come on, baby, I told you to stop. You, you got to get to that point where it doesn't matter who comes against you or what comes against you. You even tell the devil, you know what, baby, you ain't nothing but a fallen angel. And if God gave me authority over the angels that's in heaven and they said, what is man that you're mindful of him? You made even us to be subject under his feet and, and we have all, I have all this power. If, if the angels hearken to my voice when I say the word. The angels that are encamped in heaven. Who are you, devil? You know what? Come on, baby. You're just a fallen angel. Go on about your business, baby. Go on now. Don't make me pray on you and step on your head. Now, he said you're going to bruise my heel, but I'm going to bust your head wide open. That's, that's what it said. You will crush his head. He will bruise your feet. Yeah, my feet hurt, but you stomping on his head. You got to get to the point where you understand that you have authority in Jesus. Can't nothing stop you. Nothing can separate you from the love of your God. No height, no depth, no principality, no former thing, no thing to come. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Whatever comes at you, baby, it will be annihilated because he loves you that much. But you won't know this if you're not enlightened. Man. You can't be enlightened if you don't read your word. Mm -hmm. Some of you need to read your word. I know you got a little salt and pepper on you, but are you reading your word? <laughs> I know you're getting mature in your age, but are you getting mature in the word of God? Have, have you learned how to move your will out of the church and stop trying to have your will and do what God's will is? Have you matured in the word? Have you had a little talk with Jesus? Have you told him all about your problems? What have you done to enhance your relationship with Jesus? Oh, he says in Colossians 1, 9 through 12, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in his wisdom and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work 
and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened uh, with all might according to his glorious power. For all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanksgiving to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He qualifies you. See, see, y'all don't think, see, stop thinking the world's supposed to qualify you. My goodness. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I know you didn't heard it enough time for it to be embedded in your brain. God is the one that qualifies you. He called you out when he called you to be something. Yeah, study this on yourself approved. Maybe go get a couple of degrees. But at the end of the day, baby, if you don't have the anointing, you don't have the power. God is the one that qualifies you, not man. So it don't matter if man demotes you. It don't matter if man sits you down. At the end of the day, baby, when you know you're called to do something, your gift will make room for you. Mm. Look here. It said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. See, you already glorious in heaven, but you got to be able to manifest it down here. See, he says, I will provide for you all of what you need according to my riches in glory. The catch is, it's in glory. You have to raise your level to obtain what God has called you to get. You, you got you to gotta, you gotta begin to pull down those things that are above. Colossians says that God hides his blessings in spiritual places. You can't get your blessings down here. You got to call those things that are in heaven to be manifested down here. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. He said, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You already blessed in heaven. Your blessings are already there. You just got to make a manifest it down here. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. God already has every good and perfect gift waiting on you. You just need to read your word, magnify the spirit in you. See, to everyone was given a measure of faith. Everybody was given the same measure. The problem is some of us still have the same measure we got when we was little. Because we don't read our word to magnify the faith that we have. See, when you begin to feed your spirit with the word of God and feed your spirit by fasting and praying and feed your spirit by praise and worship, your spirit begins to get magnified in you and begins to get stronger because what? The sword of the spirit is what? The word of God. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Your sword just a little butter knife if you don't read your word. Some of y'all got a little pocket knife, a little bit of fingernail file. Because you're not reading your word. Some of us got a dagger because we read a little bit more. But then some of us got a sword. And the devil can't even creep up on us because the word has magnified in us. You see your enemy coming before your enemy get there because the word has been magnified your spirit of discernment. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Read your word and magnify that spirit so his will on in heaven will be done in your life and manifested right here. It's already done. Before the foundation of the world, he had already knew who you were. He already called you to be a prophet. He already called you to be a CEO. He already called you to be a lawyer. The problem is, can you manifest what's already in the spiritual realm down here? But you keep dealing with these, these daggone chickens down here on the ground worrying about them. You ain't got time to worry about these folk way down here that ain't not, that's not on your level and will never go where you're going. All you need to do is focus for the high calling and press toward the mark of the high call. Stop dealing with mess down here. Spiritual always supersedes the natural. You got supernatural powers in high places. They in high places, but they natural. They don't have no power over the Holy Spirit. The weakest part of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than the strongest force of the devil. The problem is we don't walk in it. Oh, we get mad at the white folk and black folk and Donald Trump and police. We get mad at all these frivolous things that don't mean nothing. We got to begin to call those things out by the root and tell devil, you can't have my neighborhood. You can't have my church. You can't have my children. You can't have my health. You can't have my prosperity. You can't have my mind. You can't have my grandchildren. You can't have my career. You can't have nothing. Have the mind of Christ. Christ didn't bow down to the devil. He went hungry for 40 days and still told the devil to shut up and sit down somewhere. You have a mind that's in Christ Jesus. Use it. He gave you a spirit of power 
and of a sound mind. He didn't make you timid. He didn't make you no punk. He didn't make you to have to bow down when people come against you. You ain't got to cuss them out, but you do have to stand. When you've done all you can, just stand and watch God show himself. Oh. All right, I'm on number two now. We have to understand the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, God not only desires that we know our calling in Christ, but that we have an overflowing understanding about who we are from God's perspective. That's why we're doing the Jesus perspective. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that he longed for them to be enlightened about the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Whose inheritance? Christ's inheritance. God gives us all that Christ is, has, and does, his nature, his reign, his eternal life. But what does God give Christ Jesus as his inheritance? Us. Us. You know, come on, you know when somebody dies and they leave you something, even when you don't want it, you appreciate it because they thought about you. He didn't lay me the old raggedy little jacket. Well, I'm going to wear it anyhow because they thought about you. Come on, somebody. Now, I'm not saying we raggedy. We're not raggedy, but what I'm saying is God gave Jesus an inheritance of us, which means he's supposed to protect us. Has somebody ever tried to take something your grandmama gave you? Come on, somebody, that your father gave you. Has anybody tried to just steal something that was really precious to you? Has, come on, somebody. Has anybody ever just tried to mess with your child? you got to understand that you are the inheritance of Jesus, and Jesus ain't going to be playing with nobody that continues to try to touch you and mess with you. You are the inheritance of Jesus, and Jesus said, I'm going to send you an advocate, the paraclete, the helper, the comforter, in the form of the Holy Ghost, and he will lead you into all truth. If I can't be there with you, I'm going to send a part of myself that will always be there to protect you and lead you into all truth. You are my inheritance. I'm going to protect you to the day of your heart till you're called up to be with me. Jesus so bad that he already told you how bad he was. Even though he went to the cross, he said, no man take my life. I lay it down. You, you can't kill me. That's how you got to be. You can't kill me. You can't destroy me. No matter how many lies you tell on me, no matter how much gossip, no matter how many times you fire me, if you fire me today, I have a job tomorrow. If I don't have a job tomorrow, I still won't miss a meal because I don't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of my father, I'm going to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, the lender and not the borrower. You better stop messing with me, baby, because I'm I may wobble, I might wibble, but I won't fall down because my God has always. Oh. I'm trying. Y'all know we got overflow TVs and everything. Babies can play and have a happy time and everything. Just saying. God says to Jesus Christ, in effect, look at what a wonderful inheritance you got. I gave you this. He says, he says, See, 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 this is what I'm talking about. You, you, being saved, you shouldn't be satisfied with just being saved. You should be wanting to bring somebody else to salvation. Some of us be like, I'm saved, I'm good, and that's why we don't care about no vision. We like, I'm waiting on here. Some of us enjoy funerals more than we enjoy church. I don't know if I'm going to be ooh, do my eulogy, just like that. Like, my God, I can't even think. I don't, look, when I die, oh, I ain't going to have no plans laid out. Whatever, if I die before I leave this place, before you leave, just no pastor. Whatever you do, I'm dead. I don't see it no how. I ain't thinking about my death. I just want to live. I, I, I ain't master this yet. Amen. I, yeah. He's a pastor. Preach my funeral just like that. You preach it, pastor. Same folk that look at me crazy on Sunday morning and don't like what I say, but they say, preach my funeral, pastor. <laughs> because they're not worried about life. If you came, if Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly, baby, I don't care if you 2,000 years old. You better live your life to the fullest. Try to become all that God has ordained you to be. God has ordained you to be more than just a pew sitter. 
more than just coming here eating biscuits and hot dogs. He wants you to help save somebody. Don't you want to be all that God has called you to be? Don't you want to mature and what the way God has called you? Don't you want to heal people? Don't you want to tread on serpents? Don't you want to do miracles that Jesus did? Don't you want to raise somebody from the dead? Don't you want to heal the sick? Don't you want to call the blind to walk to see? Don't you want to do that? Don't you want to walk in the glorious power? Yeah, heaven is great, but make the most of what you have down here. He's endowed you with power. Be what all Jesus has ordained you to be everything that Jesus is you have. Jesus has conquered death, which means even when you lose, you still win. To be absent from the body, to be present with God. Please understand that. Look at here. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you begin to thirst for what God wants you to do, he'll bring it. You know that, and, and it's funny, I'm just thinking about the water thing. I, 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 we, I, I, I just wanted us to do something for the people. It's ironic that it's water because thirst and water go together. You, you know what I'm saying? But he said, if you thirst for righteousness, I, I, I'm going to make sure you feel. If you begin to do what God called you to do, he's going to send the provisions. Right. You know that? Do you know if it's God's will, it's God's bill? When God gives you a vision, you know he'll work it out. You know, if, if, if he got to just begin to take folk out and kill folk to make sure it begin to hurry up and come, you know he'll do that. You know God will move. It ain't got to be a physical death, but he can move folk over here and over there. He'll move people out your way. When God gives you something, he will bring it to fruition. If you hunger and thirst for it, he will bring it to fruition. He will make it manifest if you stay the course. If you stay the course. And it says, number three, the great of please help me with the babies, the greatness of his power in us. We got yeah. no believer ever has justification for saying, I'm a weakling. As believers in Christ, we have omnipotent power of God residing in us. See, you can't go around talking about you weak. You can't because God has endowed you with power. You can't be walking around here acting like you don't have an anointing. God has given you everything that was in Christ. You don't have any excuse. That's the problem. You know why people don't like you sometimes when you walk in power and you don't worry about your enemy and whenever they attack you, you still get back up and keep on walking because then they show them they don't have no excuse. Because they have the same power you got if they operate in the Holy Spirit and stop letting the devil use them so much. If they really begin to come and sink. See, they, they didn't kill Jesus because he did wrong. They killed Jesus because Jesus began to show them their shortcomings and what they weren't doing. Y'all know what I'm saying. Ephesians 1, 19 through 23 says, The exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in which to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all the things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. All the power that God has in Jesus is where? In you. You understand? You have the same power that he has. He is the head and you are the body. Wherever your head goes, your body goes, right? So if the head has the power, so does the body. Why are we sitting here not walking in the power God ordained us to walk in? Why? Ah, thank y'all. There is no power greater than that of the Lord who lives in us. The word that Paul used for power reflects energy, strength, and might. The power of the Holy Spirit in us is this. The same resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. Is in you. Come on now. If the same power that raised Christ from the dead, what you worried about? You have power. If Christ conquered death and that same power is in you, 
Come on, somebody. Number power over all spiritual darkness. See, the power within us is greater that any that, that within us is greater than that of any force of evil. Nothing evil can stop you. You have the power. See, power over all systems, number three of the world, whether they are natural, spiritual, or human in origin, all things have been put under the feet of Christ. See, just as a little child grows in his physical strength, you grow in your strength when you begin to come in more relationship with Jesus. The more you grow in Christ, the stronger your body becomes, the stronger your spirit becomes. You can do all things through Christ who what? Strengthens you, not a little things, not some things, not most things, all things. That means nothing in the world is impossible to you because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I don't care about getting laid off from no job. I don't care about getting fired. I don't care about people talking about me. You have to have that attitude because nothing is stronger than the power of Jesus. And if Jesus is in you, who in the world can stand against you? Huh? I, it just, I know it's common sense of Christians, but sometimes we got to hear it. Look at here. He said, look, look, I guess you grow. See, Lord, how do we do this? We, 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 we got to wait on God. And waiting on God doesn't mean you just sitting here. Well, God, you told me I was going to be anointed about 1230. I've been sitting here waiting on this anointing. And I don't know what's going on, but I'm just waiting on this anointing. All right, now, 1232 now. God, where the anointing at? No, the wait on God comes from the Greek word of wait, which means to serve which means as you serve and you wait on God patiently as you serve. You know how a waiter comes to your table. If a waiter just waiting on you in the corner, come on now. They already say we don't tip, but you really ain't giving them one then if they ain't coming. <laughs> you know what they say about us is sometimes. But, but if a waiter is serving you, come on, somebody, you have to serve God as you wait on, as you serve God. Some people don't understand. Yes, God put me here, and you'll never be ready to pass no matter how old, how old a season you are. But God began to put me here even before I had matured, even before I got to the point I am now. And I still have grown because until the day you die, you should continue to mature and grow in Christ. But God will put you somewhere and make sure he matures you as you go along. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You got to serve him. God gives you the power you need when you need it. And if you're sitting on your blessed assurance and you're not getting up, he has no reason to endow you with power. Ooh, Jesus said you shall receive power in Acts 1.8. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the outer ends of the earth. See, he who was in you is greater than he who was in the world. 1 John 4, 4. God has given you power. See, while we are no... See, see, look at this, look at this. Let me, let me just read this one more thing. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Look at here. You got to know Christ. While we are to know our calling, who we are in Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit in us, the greatest knowing that we can ever know is knowing Christ. I don't mean, I don't mean knowing about Christ. I mean knowing Christ. You know how you know somebody at church because you see them or you know them at the barbershop and you wave at them because you see them in the mall, but you don't know their name, but you know who they are, but you really don't know them. Yeah, that's so-and-so. I don't know their name, but they go to the same barbershop I go to. I done been known for over like 20 years and still don't know their name. Sit in the barbershop, talk to them, and go home, and then they still don't know their name. So that means I really don't know them. I, I know about them, but I don't know them. See, some of us know about Christ, but we really don't know Christ. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You, 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 you got to know who he is. You got to have an intimate relationship with him. You got to develop an intimate an intimate relationship with you. You got to know him. See, to know somebody in the Bible meant you done did the do. Come on, somebody. That means y'all done had intercourse with each other, but I ain't saying all that. But what I'm saying is you got to be close. You got to really know Jesus. When you know that he went to the cross for you. When you know he bled and died for you. When you know that he was strung high and every joint in his body was dislocated. When you know he was beaten to a bloody pulp. 
hung, his instruments hung out, and he carried the cross for you. You won't worry about naysayers. He carried the cross for you even with his entrails hanging out, holding his intestines in one hand, carrying the cross in the other, up the Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering in the hot blazing sun. Walk over dead bodies when he got to Golgotha. Walk through feces. Walk through rigor mortis written bodies. Walk through death. Let them string him up on the cross. Let them beat him to a bloody pope. Had the crown of thorns on his head where he couldn't even see the people before him. They drew lots for his clothes in front of him and his mother. When you understand that he went through all that for you to have power, when you fall short of his glory, you won't let anybody make you feel bad. You will say a saint is just a sinner that got up, that fell down and, and got back up again. You will understand that I know I fall short of the glory of God, but God has called me. He's made me fearfully and wonderfully, and I made a mistake. My mistake may be public, but I know you got some mistakes too because we all fall short of the glory of God. When you understand that he loved you so much that even ask God three times, if there's any other way, God, take this cup from me. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to become sin, but not my will, your will. If God saw in himself 100% human, yet 100% divine, could lay down his will, why you can't lay down your will in church? Why you can't lay down your will in your life? Huh? Why you got to have your own vision and not the vision that God has given the house? Why? If God himself went against what he wanted mentally, who are we not to deny ourselves? Mm. Lord, I'm trying to get out of here. I got another sermon. The word says in 2 Timothy 1.12, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. He said, look here, Paul was saying, even though they beat me, even though they ostracized me, because I know who I am, I ain't going to worry about it. Even though they persecute me, I don't care because you know why? I know who I am. I know I believe Jesus, and I know Jesus allowed me to go through this for a reason. I know he didn't put it on me, but I know he allowed Satan to do it to make me better and make me tougher or to use me for a witness. I, I, the reason why I'm going through this holy hell right now is because God knew I could handle it. God said, I hear never put more on you than you can bear. So if you're going through more hell than your neighbor, don't be jealous of your neighbor. Just know that God knows you can handle the hell that he Allowed to be put on you. But you won't understand that until you become enlightened in his word and read it and know what he's saying. Paul said, I know I'm suffering. I know I get beat, but at the end of the day, baby, I'll be all right. And we know that the Son of God in 1 John 5.20 has come and has given us an, un an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ. See, look, if we in him, look at why do we need to know what that we are called of God? So that we can have the hope about our own future and have a direction for our lives. Why do we need to know that we are the inheritors of Christ Jesus? So that we will begin to reflect the value that God places upon us. Why do we need to know that we have been given exceedingly great power in the Holy Spirit so we will act boldly to be courageous in the face of evil, doubt, and persecution? The good news is not only that we must be enlightened about our position in Christ Jesus, but that we have been given wisdom and revelation. God has given us the ability to know, the ability to understand, the ability to discern, the ability to make sound judgments and wise decisions. God does not hold back from us. He don't be trying to pay, keep away with us. He don't let us have a mystery. He reveals to us what he means. The non-believer may not be able to understand what we understand, but he will give it to us right away. He does not try to withhold any good or perfect thing from us. He might withhold it from the non-believer, but when you call on Jesus, he will give you an understanding if you ask. See, you got to ask. And don't worry, babies, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. You almost made it. You're going to get your bottle in about two seconds, baby. <laughs> Second Timothy 1, 7, I'm going to read through these scriptures and you begin to just internalize what I'm saying. 
you got to let the, the word marinate down in you. It says, 2 Timothy 1.17 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He gave you power. He didn't make you weak and timid. You don't need to worry about what's going on in life. You don't need to worry about people coming against you. He gave you power. Jesus said in John 16, 13, and 14, he said, When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit will be an intercessor for you. He'll begin to hear what God is saying to you and begin to tell you what you need to do in your spirit. But you have got to begin to listen to the Holy Spirit. How many times have you said, something told me not to do this? Something told me not to trust her? That was the Holy Spirit. Stop giving it to something told you. The Holy Spirit is always there to protect you and to lead you into all truth. It's a part of God himself self that's in you. That's why it says greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world because God himself lives in me. Ooh. Have you ever just heard that God lives in you and you worried? I know America look crazy but it's always been racist. Y'all don't think it happened just called Donald Trump running. Now they had a black person and they let you know their true colors. He doesn't know how to be quiet like some of the other folks. Can I, can I talk to you? See, see, sometimes people in the spirit have already been seeing that racism ain't dead, but sometimes God will peel back the layers so you can see it obviously for yourself. So white people and black people can see it. Come on, somebody. So Hispanic people and Asian people can see it. So everybody can see that evil still resides in the midst of you. Come on now, we took the Bible out of school. We ain't walking in no holiness. We got in God we trust on money, but that really is our God. We ain't no Christian society. We're a capitalist society. And we thought that everything was all right. Now you're getting scared. No, baby. You just met a call on I am. It's always been that way. He just allowed you to walk in darkness for a while because you weren't able to be able to see what's really still going on. You got to hear me right now. It don't matter if Donald Trump win or not. You still will be redeemed. Can't nobody put y'all. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Ah, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Don't matter who the president is. Now, go out and vote just to make sure we can take care of ourselves because we can vote. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who wins. God is your salvation. God is your battle act. God is your feast of week. God is your buckler. Worrying about nobody. I don't care who wins. At least the truth out there now. At least y'all really know if some of y'all black folk be around. I, I, see, I, I, I'm a vote for whoever I think going to do it, but, but y'all need to go on and see the, all the Republicans ain't what y'all thought they were. Yeah. I, I know I know, I ain't going to be talking about that, but can I talk for a while? Can I just keep it real for one second? Can I talk to somebody? You don't understand what I'm saying. You worry about the wrong thing. I don't care if a Democrat or Republican win. All I know is my enemy is not the white man. My enemy is not the black man. My enemy is not the police. My enemy is the devil, and he's the person I got to go at. Uh-uh, it's the evil of the devil that happened. That's why you can't get mad at people. Come on, have you ever seen the Super Friends? Come on, take me back. I know some of y'all don't win the cartoon. And they be fighting, and all of a sudden this evil person takes over the mind of one of the people, and they be doing whatever they say. Oh, and their eyes be turning, and they don't want to kill Superman because Superman cool, and they don't want to kill Batman, but some evil thing has taken them over. So they don't try to kill Batman, but what they try to do is figure out the source of what's going on, and they try to get the bug out of the head of Superman so he can be Superman again, and he won't be evil. And that's what you need to do. You got to stop getting mad at folk and begin to go to the root of the spirit and know that your weapons are not carnal, but are spiritual for the casting down of strongholds and vain imagination. Nation. And anything that I the white man is not your enemy. The police are not your enemy. The enemy is the devil, and we gotta speak to that spirit. Stop concentrating on this stuff down here. Stuff can't stop you. Let me go on and get out of here. 
for real. Y'all on punishment. Keep y'all over time. Psalm 11998 through 100 and 104 through 5 says, You, through your commandments, don't cry, babe. I told you I'm almost through. Make me wiser than my enemies. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Though your precepts, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. As long as I stay in the word, God will lead me into all truth. See, the problem is we read the word and we, we remember the word, but do we really walk in the power of the word? Do you really believe that you will be the lender and not the bar, the head and not the tail? Do you really understand what he says, that I will keep you and hide you in the secret place? Do you really understand that that means no weapon formed against you shall prosper? Do you really understand that he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and your staff will cover me. Do you realize that that staff is for your enemies, but sometimes it's for you because sometimes you get out of line and he got to get you back where you're supposed to be with that staff? Do you not understand? Do you really live by the word or do you just remember the word? Some people can remember the word just like Denzel Washington in the book of Eli from Genesis to Revelation, but they don't use it to walk in power. The word is power. And if you really stay in your word, you can walk in this power I'm talking about. If you really fast and stay on the fast that we set for the course and really read the word I sent you. See, see, you got to understand, some of those scriptures you probably don't even know what's going on. But if you read the stories, it begins to show you vision and the spirit will begin to speak to you. They, they weren't assigned frivolously. They were assigned because it shows you that even though you come against leadership, leadership going to win if they really called of God. It shows you that if you come in line with the vision, God will bless you. You got to begin to read your word and meditate on it day and night. Your word is the only thing that can save you. The word is the only thing that can deliver you. Because when you read the word, you begin to magnify the Holy Spirit in your life. You begin to magnify the Holy Spirit in you. And oh, y'all don't hear me. I'm finna stop. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. But until you read your word, who knows? Do you have a sword because you've been reading your word? Or do you still have a butter knife? You still got a pocket knife. Because you've not magnified the Holy Spirit within you. Because you really haven't been studying your word. Get in your word so the Holy Spirit can be magnified in you. And know who you are in Christ. And know if Christ bled on that cross. Know if Christ took the crown of thorns in his head. Know if they drew lots on him. See, I know we look at the, the crucifixion. And sometimes we look at the crucifixion. And we see the loincloth on Jesus. Jesus was naked on the cross to hide your nakedness. He was naked so you could be a deacon. He was naked so you could be a pastor. He was naked so you could be a priest. He was naked so you could be delivered. His nakedness covered you. Come on, somebody. Y'all got to understand, Jesus went through all that stuff for you. But the problem is, the keys to the kingdom are in his word, but we don't read them. If we read the word, the spirit will be magnified in us, and we will walk as an enlightened saint, knowing what God is speaking to us. Now, I know today you heard a word, and it may be a little confusing to you if you don't know who Jesus is. And if you really want to walk in the power that I'm talking about, if you really want to walk in the understanding that I'm talking about, it's time for you to make a decision. Those on Periscope, those on YouTube, if you want to make a decision for God, find you a local church. Find you somewhere that's close because some of you all are all over the nation and the world that look at it. But find you a church home. Find you somewhere to lay your head. Find you somewhere to pay your tithes and offerings so that God can cover you. But I'm talking to the people right here as well. Is it time for you to make a decision? See, some of us say, I want to get my life right first, and then I'm going to come to Jesus. Well, you wouldn't sit up there and, and cut yourself open, give yourself open-heart surgery, then go to the hospital. But that's what you're, in essence, saying when it comes to your salvation. You're saying, you know what, I'm going to get myself together first, and then I'm going to come to Jesus. No, this is the time.